Hello, Photo One students. This is a lecture on the basic parts of your camera so that you can be more familiar with how your camera works and hopefully take better pictures. Um, I know it's not the most exciting information, but it's important that you go through it um, and it'll be really beneficial, I promise, um, at the end. Also, you will have a quiz on this material, so please pay attention. This PowerPoint is located on final site in your resource folder as well. So the basic parts of the camera, um, these are things that we've gone through already. A viewing system, system, this is your viewfinder. It's basically a sighting device that enables the user to aim the camera accurately. On your cameras, you also have the ability to use the LCD screen to view. It's called LV mode. If you want to know more about that and you're unsure, you can always come up and ask me. The aperture, this is an opening that admits light into the camera. It's in your lens. It's adjustable by a device called a diaphragm, which controls the amount of light that enters. So I do have a lens that I can show you how it opens and closes, and I'll probably go around um, and do that at some point during this lecture. Um, the lens, it collects light and projects an image onto the sensor. A shutter, it's like a movable screen or a little curtain that keeps all the light out of the camera until the moment you want to take a picture. Pressing the exposure button or the silver button opens the shutter for an instant just long enough to admit enough light to make a satisfactory exposure. And then there's the focusing mechanism. This moves the lens back and forth so that it can project a sharp image of objects at various distances. On our cameras, we have a automatic focusing mode and a manual. So when you first start taking pictures, please look at that setting and decide which one you want to use um, so that you know what's going on with your camera. Also, you have a zoom feature as well, which is a bigger ring in the center of your lens that you can use. All right, so you've already heard me talk about aperture and shutter, and I wanted to explain a little bit more about those because those are really important in exposing your picture correctly. They can also control some creative aspects um, of your image making as well. So aperture and shutter, I want you to think of those as controllers of light. To expose an image correctly so that your picture is neither too light or too dark, you need to control the amount of light that enters the camera, and you have the ability to do that manually. For now, we've been putting our camera in program mode or automatic mode, and it's adjusting the aperture and shutter for us, but I want you guys to be able to do it manually if you want. So aperture changes the size of the lens opening through which light enters the camera, and so basically it really controls how much the light is reaching the sensor, so the amount of light based on the opening, whether it's small or large. Your shutter speed changes the length of time that light strikes the sensor. So as long as that shutter stays open, it's letting in more light. So they both control light, but in different ways. So the best way to think about how your aperture works is to think about the pupil of your eye. It can enlarge and contract to admit more or less light. This is done in the camera with the diaphragm, which is a ring of thin overlapping metal leaves located inside the lens. Again, I'll have one of these up at the cart. Um, if you want to come up and look at it, and I can show you what I'm talking about if you need more of a visual. The leaves are movable. Turning the aperture ring of the lens, which actually we're not going to be doing. There is an aperture ring, but your camera does it for you. We're going to be setting the aperture since we have a digital computerized camera through the computer. But basically it rotates the leaves out of the way so that most of the light reaching the surface of the lens passes through. A turn in the opposite direction will close the diaphragm until the aperture becomes very small, so less light passes through the lens. So these little sizes, or aperture sizes, are called f-stops, and they're a scale of numbers that you will see in your camera. Um, the term stop refers to aperture size as um, a lens is said to be stopped down when the size of the aperture is decreased. So sometimes I'll be like, why don't you open up your aperture? or stop down your aperture, um, and that's really basically just opening and closing the aperture um, based on the lighting situation. So what I want you to do now is to turn your camera on 
and activate the LCD screen. So when you do that, you'll actually see two numbers, and you'll actually see an F in front of one of the sets of numbers, and that, that's your F stop. There's a little scrolling um, mechanism near the top of your camera. I can show you this, and hopefully I'll show you this at the beginning of class, but you can always stop the video and come up if you need more clarification. So this standard of numbers that you see at the very top um, correlates to different aperture openings ranging from large to small. And again, we refer to those as f-stops. So every camera has f1.4, f2, f2.8, and it goes down. Some cameras have a little bit more beyond the ends of the scale, so um, a better lens might actually open up more to like f1 and so forth. So as you can see, it's kind of the opposite of what you would think. The numbers that you see, like F1, denotes a large opening, at least on this scale, the largest opening. And then as we increase the number, the opening gets smaller. So where you get down to F64, it's very tiny and hardly letting in any light. So I know that can be a little confusing, um, but it is really important because aperture does control some creative elements of your photograph that you might want to um, adjust manually. So the lower the f-stop number, the wider the lens opening. Each setting lets in twice as much light as the next f-stop up the scale and half as much light as the next number down the scale. So that's how you want to think of it. As you open up your aperture, you're letting in twice as much light. As you're stopping down, you're letting in half as much light. So here you can see some scenarios about the f-stops. I'm just going to kind of let you read through those. Okay. Also, the term stop refers to a change in exposure, whether the aperture or shutter speed has changed. So often you'll hear photographers use stop to denote exposure and not just aperture. So to give one stop more exposure means to double the amount of light reaching the sensor, either by opening the next larger aperture up or by doubling the exposure with time, which is related to your shutter. To give one stop less exposure means to cut the light reaching the sensor in half, stopping down to the next smaller aperture setting or having the exposure time. And then again, that's related to your shutter, which we'll go over in a little bit. So the reason why you want to control your aperture or at least be aware of what aperture setting you're shooting at is that it controls something called depth of field. With a maximum lens opening, there is very little depth of field, meaning that the foreground and background will be blurred when taking a photo of a person several feet away. There are situations, depending on the subject being photographed, where the background and foreground should be emphasized. Okay, so the wider your aperture opening, um, it, it decreases the amount of depth of field. And you also want to maybe think of depth of field as depth of focus. How much is in focus? In particular, how much is in focus from foreground to background? And I will show you some examples. As the aperture opening gets smaller, the depth of field focus increases and more of the scene from near to far appears sharp in the photograph. So as a photographer, you will want to be able to control the depth of field. So here's a little diagram that shows you the correlation of the f-stops and the openings. So in the old days, they used to have an aperture ring where you could turn and some cameras still have this, a ring to adjust your aperture. For our cameras, we actually do it, um, There's a, it's a different way, but it has the same set of numbers and it, it pretty much operates the same way. So here you can see f2.8 is the largest opening, and then as we increase the number, the opening gets a little bit smaller until here on this particular, particular lens, the smallest opening is f22. So you can see how it would change the amount of light entering the camera. All right, so here's an example of a picture shot with different aperture openings. 
one with a small aperture, the other with a large aperture. It's the same subject pretty much, but I wanted you to, guys to see the difference. So the one shooting with a small aperture, letting in less light, um, you can see that everything is in focus from foreground, midground, and background. So that is what depth of field controls in terms of focus. Focus can be a little confusing because you think of actually focusing the camera, um, but for our purposes, it's what's in focus from foreground, midground to background. So you can see everything's in focus. So this other picture over here was shot with a larger aperture opening. So here, the foreground is in focus, but the midground and um, background are blurred. And that's what I mean by shallow depth of field. So we really can't see many details in the background. And neither one is bad. It just depends on the aesthetic that you're going for. So in this picture, we can see that the man using the large aperture setting um, is emphasized while the background is blurred, sort of eliminating a lot of clutter. Here, we can see everything in view. And so there are multiple points of um, emphasis. So we can go here, our eye goes here, it maybe goes back in here, it travels a little bit more in the photo. Again, it's ne neither one is bad or better than the other. It just depends on what you're going for. And as a photographer, I want you to be able to control depth of field. So that's why you want to be able to maybe um, at least know what aperture setting you're on and the effect it's going to have on your image. So the next controller of light is your shutter, and it controls the amount of light by length of time it remains open. Shutter speed settings are in seconds or fractions of seconds. So when you act, when you look on the back of your camera and activate the LCD screen, you should see another set of numbers, and they probably do look like fractions of seconds. Um, some cameras will just have like 1,500, and that really means one one thousandth of a second. So here's the scale. Again, just like your aperture, this is a standard set of numbers that all cameras have. Depending on how expensive or nice the camera is, they will extend beyond this. Like, so some cameras can be as fast as one one, one five thousandth of a second. And then some cameras can slow down to you know, whole seconds. And with our cameras that you have, you can actually do a 30 second exposure. Again, this is a little bit different. You have to um, activate your LCD screen and then there's a scrolling mechanism, again, that allows you to kind of go through the series of numbers. Each setting, like your aperture, lets in as much light as the next faster setting half as much light as the next slower setting. So you want to think of shutter speed as fast and slow. So it has the same reciprocal relationship that aperture has. So as you're moving down the scale, say you're shooting at one one thousandth of a second, and then you decide to slow it down to one five hundredth of a second, it's the equivalent of letting in twice as much light. Say you're shooting at one sixtieth of a second, and you want to increase your shutter speed, you are letting in half as much light, the equivalent. So that way you can control aperture and shutter. And you know that if you're using, if you're using a really slow shutter speed, you might have to use a, a wider, bigger aperture to compensate. There's also a setting called bulb, which is really useful sometimes if you're out at night um, and this basically keeps the shutter open as long as you hold down the exposure button. So shutter is important because it controls motion. So just like aperture, it you know controlled depth of field, shutter can be a controller of motion. Again, this is an aesthetic or creative portion of the picture that I want you as a photographer to be able to understand. A blurred image can occur when an object moves in front of the camera that is not moving. If the object moves swiftly or if the shutter is open for a relatively long time, this moving image will blur and be indistinct. If the shutter speed is in, it increases, the blur can be reduced or eliminated. You can control this effect and even use it to your advantage. 
So a fast shutter speed freezes a moving object. A slow shutter speed can be used deliberately to increase the blurring and accentuate the feeling of motion. So here is a scale to demonstrate the idea of how your shutter speed works. And so here is a good example um, of where you might see your f-stop as well as your shutter speed. So this is right here is what it probably looks like. So here's the P, the program mode. 250 over here indicates the shutter. So that's 1 250th of a second. And then you'll see like a 5.6 down here, which is the aperture. So it's like a combination um, to correctly expose your picture. So here we can see this idea of time. So 1 500th of a second, it stays open the amount of this gray area. This is just a visual um, diagram to show you. And then as we slow down the shutter speed, so now we're at 1 250th of a second, it's a little bit longer. And the equivalent of letting in twice as much light. And again, as you move down the scale and make your shutter speed slower, the amount of time that little shutter stays open letting light in um, will control motion. So these are just different types of cameras that might, um, there are different ways of where these aperture and shutter speeds will be located. You can see them in the viewfinder when you look through. Um, older cameras have this little ring up here and then our cameras ha also have this LCD screen. So here is an image um, of the same subject shot at different shutter speeds. So just like aperture, it controls blurring, but in a different way. So here over to the right, we see this image of a biker. The camera is stationary and the biker is moving across the frame. It's shot at a very fast shutter speed, 1 500th of a second, so it freezes or stops the action. Here, the same su subject um, is moving across the angle of view of the camera while the camera is stationary, and this is a much slower shutter speed. So it's going to, rec it's going to record that blurring or that sort of trace um, movement. And again, neither one is bad or better than the other. It's just an aesthetic difference and one that um, you can have the decision in making. Often when your pictures are blurry, it's because there's not enough light and you're having to use, your camera's having to resort to using a slower shutter speed. So that's why sometimes at night when you're taking pictures or, you know, out with your friends, um, it just isn't enough light. So it's having to, and your aperture's already all the way open and it's just trying to compensate for the low light situation. But again, I at least want you to be able to at least know what shutter speed you're on so you can sort of understand how that might affect the picture. So here is an example of various shutter speeds. Again, we describe shutter speed as fast, medium, slow. So here is the same sub subject, some, some birds in a park flapping around. <laughs> so here with the fast shutter speed, we can see it pretty much freezes the action. Um, a slower shutter speed, maybe in between, you can still see some details, but you can see a little bit of motion in where the birds are flapping their wings. And then um, a very slow shutter speed, you can see how it records the motion to the point where they almost look like they're disappearing or sort of ghost-like. Again, this can be really cool if it's what you're going for. So here's some examples of shutter speed that I think are used creatively. Um, imagine what this photo would look like if the photographer had stopped the action using a fast shutter speed. Here it gives it a sense of mood. Um, it kind of looks haunting. Here's another image, um, this little boy is waving his arms and he's doing it so much and the shutter speed is so slow that um, it basically disappears. And again, this kind of gives it a ghost um, haunting feeling or sort of surreal aesthetic. All right, 
So both aperture and shutter speed affect the amount of light um, that enter the camera. To get a correctly exposed image, one that is neither too light or too dark, you have to find a combination of shutter speed and aperture that will let in the right amount of light for a particular scene. Both shutter speed and aperture affect sharpness or blurriness, but act quite differently. Again, shutter speed affects the sharpness of moving objects, and the aperture affects the sharpness from near to far. Once you know any single combination of shutter speed and aperture, that will let in the right amount of light, you can change one setting as long as you change the other in the correct direction. Since each aperture setting lets in twice as much light as the next smaller size, and each shutter speed lets in half as much light as the next slower speed. So guidelines, just to think about. You can use a larger aperture if you use a faster shutter speed. You can use a smaller aperture if you're using a slower shutter speed. So if you know a combination of aperture and shutter settings that are correctly exposing your image, if you decide like, hey, I want to increase my depth of field, so say you're shooting, or I want to decrease my depth of field, say you're shooting at f22 at one second, you could stop down that um, aperture to f11, and that's about two stops difference letting in about four times the amount of light, but then you can compensate by slowing down your shutter speed to one-fourth of a second. Um, and again, that's for when you're on a manual setting. And I don't expect you guys to do this unless um, you're really into it. I just want you guys to be aware of the aperture and shutter that you're using so you can predict what your picture is going to look like. Now, there is a mechanism in your camera called um, a light meter that helps you figure out um, the proper aperture and shutter. So um, the way it works is you can set your aperture and then move your shutter speed around. There's a set of lights that indicate when the exposure is right. And then, you know, when you get the shutter on the correct exposure and then it, it tells you it's, it's perfect lighting. Um, and that's how you meter, and I'll show you how to do that as well. But for now, you don't have to do it. Um, you can use one of the semi-automatic modes, um, which I'll demonstrate to you guys in a minute or some at some point. So what I was trying to say before is that once you know any single combination of shutter speed and aperture that will let in the right amount of light, you can change one setting as long as you change the other in the correct direction. So again, if you know that this is, you know, the reciprocal relationship of letting in twice as much light, having the light, you should be able to figure out um, this different aperture and shutter combinations. Um, that will expose a picture correctly, but will affect the picture differently. You might get a picture that has more depth of field versus a picture that has shallow depth of field. So we'll practice this in terms of um, trying to figure out like what aperture you're shooting at, and then say you make a change, um, what shutter you would select. So again, the relationship between shutter and aperture is known as reciprocal. So the light meter in your camera will tell you when you have a combination of shutter and aperture that will yield a properly exposed negative. That is why it is important for you to understand how your light meter functions in your camera. So this is something that I will show you um, as soon as I can. It might be, it might not be till tomorrow. Or I might have done it right before class. We'll see. And I'll obviously do it multiple times. And I will certainly, if you have questions, will help you individually um, in learning the features of the camera. I know this is a lot of technical information. I don't expect you to get it all right away. But I do expect you to go back over this PowerPoint, um, especially to study for the quiz, which you will have one. I don't really like giving quizzes, but it's the only way I can motivate you to really get this information under your belt. But once you do, it'll be a lot more fun from this point and you will have um, a lot more creative control over how your pictures are. So here we have a scale of numbers. Um, we have the shutter speed and aperture across from each other so that we can pick out different combinations of aperture and shutter. So, and this is a good visual to kind of show you the relationship. 
So slower shutter speed, more light enters, um, but there's more of a chance of motion blurring. Faster shutter speed, less light enters, less chance of motion blurring. Here we have aperture settings, a larger aperture, more light enters the camera, but you get less depth of field. And a smaller aperture, less light enters, more depth of field. So in a lot of lighting situations, if you are using a large aperture like f2.8, you can get away with using really fast shutter speeds and vice versa. If you're using an aperture that's very tiny, depending on the light situation, you're probably going to have to slow down your aperture to compensate um, and get the correct exposure. So this is a really useful chart if you really want to be able to kind of figure out different combinations of shutter and aperture. We'll probably play a game where I'll, I'll give you um, an aperture and shutter setting and then I'll say, okay, now open up your aperture um, two stops. How What shutter speed would you have to use based on that change? Again, I know it's a lot of information, it's technical, but once you get it under your belt, it's really not that hard. So that's the end of this little presentation. Again, we will go over this information in a more, you know, informal sense as you are actually going on photo shoots and taking pictures. Again, I'm, I'm always available to sit down with you as well during class or um, after school or, or sometime to help you get this um, idea of aperture and shutter down. All right, so thanks for listening. We will probably have a few more PowerPoints when we talk about exposure in more detail, um, lighting. But again, once we get this information down, it'll, it'll be a lot of fun for you guys. All right. Take care.